Hello, everyone. Welcome back, and thank you for joining us on the Live Unreal with Glover You podcast, where every week, Jeff Glover will dive deep into the questions that you are asking. He understands the challenges you're facing on a day-to-day basis because he still works every day on the front lines of real estate, with him and his team closing over 1,000 homes per year. In today's episode, we'll be interviewing a panel of top producers on how to generate massive listing leads. You'll learn from Jeff and his guest how to generate listing leads to achieving a higher ROI. Now let's hear from Jeff Glover. So welcome to the stage, our panelists. We have Mr. Eric Monzo, Frank Montro, Seychelle Van Poole, Daniel Beer, and Christy Smith. Well, All right. thank you kindly. There we go. Okay, so we like to have a little bit of break in the action, and quite frankly, we like doing panels for a couple reasons. Number one, because um, not everyone from here, or, or not everyone that's out in the audience today, is from the state of Michigan, as we saw earlier. So a lot of people say, yeah, that wouldn't work in my market. Yeah, that wouldn't work in my market or where I'm at. So we like to bring other people up so we can hear what they're doing in their market, because I will tell you almost every time, it does work in your market, and you'll see that. Uh, But also in this particular panel, what I'm mostly excited about is the topic of becoming a listing master, becoming a master of dominating listings is not only important from, uh, okay, what does the presentation and the sales skills look like, but where do you guys get these leads? Where, you know, this is like a, this, I'm not finding a lot of sellers or our inventories are low. So if you would, I will start with Eric first and we'll work our way down. Do me a favor and introduce yourself. Tell us uh, where you're from, location, brokerage, uh, how long you've been in the business. And uh, I'll repeat these because I have a little lengthy list here. So where you're from, location, brokerage, how long you've been in the business, transaction and or volume, whatever comes to mind that you did last year, and your goal for this year, and of course your zodiac sign. Zodiac. I don't know the zodiac sign, so I apologize. Well, tell us your birthday. We'll try to figure it out. August 25th. Don't forget it. Okay. Who's like what do we know? What's August 25th? You're a Leo. Leo? Leo, baby. Uh, okay. Yeah. Virgo? Learn something new every day. All right. So now you know. You're a Virgo. Now you can start reading your horoscopes in the paper and start telling people how your day's going to be. I'll start winking, too. No worries. <laughs> All right. Uh, so take it away. As Jeff said, my name's Eric Monzo. Uh, I run a team out of uh, Keller Williams Great Lakes. Um, so we are affiliate, affiliated with Jeff. Um, it's in Mount Cloud which is about 15 to 20 minutes outside of the city of Detroit. Uh, We have a team of 30 agents that work with us. Some of those uh, good looking folks over there in the back right. Um, Last year we did 780 transactions. This year the goal is 1,000. Love it, love it. Let's, 780 transactions, let's hear it for them. Thank you. See, he's on, he's on my tail, so next year I'm going to have to say, well, we're not number one in Michigan anymore, because it sounds like you might be, buddy. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks for being here. Frank. I was born on the 4th of July. Are there any cancers in the room? Put your hands up. <laughs> All right. Cancers. All right. From Keller Williams Preferred Real Estate, the beautiful Orland Park, Illinois. I've been in business for 36 years. Last year, I closed 374 transactions to the tune of $64 million and some change. Anything else you need to know about me? All right, well, let's hear it. That's good, that's good. Now you know who you were hearing back there, by the way. (laughs) Throw money, throw money. (laughs) Love it. All right, Seychelle, good to see you. Hi, everybody. Uh, Seychelle Van Poole from Dallas, Texas. And uh, we're with Keller Williams down in Dallas. And uh, we did 74 million last year, 225 sales. This year we'll do 325 sales for 112 million. Uh, and I'm a Virgo. All right, another Virgo. Hey, you guys get, we're hitting it off backstage, huh? All right, let's hear it for Actually, yeah. Daniel. Hey, I'm Dan Beer from San Diego. We're in the Beer Home Team at EXP Realty. Uh, last year we did 303 transactions, 215 million. I like awesome. your price point. All right, just, that average sales price, price sounds good to me. I'm a Gemini. And you're a Gemini. Hey, I'm a Gemini. All right, cool. Let's go. hear it for him. That's a great volume. Great volume. Hi there, I'm Christy Smith from Indianapolis, and I run the Indie Homes team, IndieHomes.com. And uh, I'm a Sagittarius. <laughs> we uh, started in 2003, and my goal this year is 75 million, and that'll be about 160 transactions. Love it. All right, let's hear it for her. That's great numbers. 
so what, what I love about this panel is, is we have someone from every different part of the country, essentially, and they're all doing big numbers, so I'm excited to dig into this. And by the way, uh, thank you again. I don't know if you guys were in the room when I shared the story, but that was based on our conversation last night at the Hotel Indigo, so thank you. Both Dan and Christy said, hey, nobody knows your story. You gotta share it, so thank you for, for having me do that. Okay, so I have written down here, how did you arrive, being that we're talking about building a listing-based business, how did you arrive at the decision that you wanted to focus on sellers versus buyers? How did you come to that realization? What, what was it that sparked that and, and why was that important to you at that time? How'd you arrive at that? Go for it. Going down the line? Oh, yeah, okay. whoever, I mean, you know, off there. You answer. hate my answer with this one. Hey, and no. I'm gonna go, so we did a panel at the DAC in Detroit, um, yep. and this is not something, this wasn't a decision I ever made in, mm -hmm. in uh, my real estate career. It's something that just kind of happened organically and naturally. Uh, I've always looked at it as, you know, buyers are sellers and sellers are buyers. And if you're working hard and you're working every single day and you're treating your clients uh, the right way, they're gonna come back to you and they're gonna come back and they're gonna be sellers. So, you know, my business, uh, obviously, when I realized that, how much less effort came into it, I obviously latched on and we grew the team. So Awesome. Love it. All right. Great. Who else wants to tackle that one? Seller business. How did you arrive at the decision to do seller business? So I'd reached the ceiling, right? Mm -hmm. Most of my business was buyer business. I'd reached yep. the ceiling, just like you were talking about earlier. And... You know, I think there's so many people in that messy middle that now is becoming uh, the term for when you're trying to break through and, and trying to do more. And I was having a conversation with somebody at lunch, and I just, you know, for me, I decided that I had worked my last buyer, which was a very uh, scary decision because mm -hmm. that was my business, mm -hmm. right? I only was listing homes by accident or someone I'd sold a home to would miraculously call me and ask me to list it. Yep. But I found somebody, and that's what we all have to go do. We have to find somebody. I found somebody that I had the confidence to hand them the buyer business. Mm -hmm. And I said, this is it. I'm not doing another buyer transaction regardless of if it's my brother, yep. my mom, my dad, doesn't matter. Yes. I'm done. Yep. And so that might sound like I gave up my entire business, but keep in mind, I didn't go to 0%. I still had, you know, at the time, 60% of that income with that person running the buyer business. So mm -hmm. I gave up 40% to get 100% of my time back. Yep. And that was a risk that I took that I felt was worth taking. Yep. And businesses have to do that at some point. So you gave up, which by the way, I, I, I've encouraged agents for years to use the showing agent model. Which would have been probably an even better step. I yep. just didn't know that model at the time. Yeah, and you essentially did that. You did, you did that without even knowing it. Right, but if I had known that model, I could have done it and actually kept more. Mm -hmm. And so instead of keeping 60. Well, yeah, because a showing agent, you might pay 25% or 20% depending on your market. That yep. leaves you with all your time, or left me with all my time to fill it with <coughs> a listing business. Yep. Makes sense. Yeah. So with Dan, that was very similar to how we arrived at the listing business as well, is I got in the business in 04 in Dallas, mm -hmm. and that was when we were still a red hot seller's market, and I worked buyers, which was a genius move. And you know every buyer I worked with was over the barrel. You know My first year, I think I did 36 buyers, and so every buyer transaction, you're just begging, you, know, I'll, you can have my firstborn, you can have whatever. Right, and so between 04 and 07, I did buyers, and um, I just, for me, I wanted more control on the transaction. I wanted more control of my time. The showing agent model wasn't around yet, yeah. and I wish it had been when I was in that model. And I learned, um, we have an amazing team, and uh, one of our team members, Marie, was coming back into the team, and I, tr I trusted her with my life, and it was the right who that we were able to bring into the buyer business, and I was brilliant, right, in 07, and then turned to be a listing agent, and that was right when our market tanked. So for the first eight years of business, I was never on the quote-unquote winning side of the transaction. Yeah. I was always in the difficult side, but what I loved about the listing side is I could control the expectations that I set which allowed me to create quality of life, which allowed me to have a marriage that I wanted, which allowed yep. me to grow and focus on building our team and pouring into our people and learning uh, what I needed to do to become a business leader so that we could then create opportunities for people in our yep. organization to continue to grow. So this isn't, and, and again, if somebody else wants to take that, go for it. But one of the things that just came to mind that I think the audience always wonders when we hear this conversation of giving up the buyer business to focus on sellers, what goes through a lot of agents' minds, which probably went through my mind as well when I made that decision was, 
yeah, but wh what am I sacrificing? What am I giving up? How am I going to be able to afford to do that when I'm used to working this business? You know, I, I did three buyer deals last month. If I don't do three buyer deals this month, I might not be able to pay the bills. So isn't there this kind of like taking a step back to take two steps forward that you have to go through that just is painful and maybe you're broke for a little bit or what does that look and like? And we're in business, right? So that might require an investment. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, so often agents are looking to not do that. I think that is a big fear. Remember, you're not going to zero you're still going to collect income from that buyer business, it's just mm -hmm. not gonna be 100% of it anymore. But I think the other challenge people face too, is they say, but I've tried to bring people on and they leave or they take advantage of me or they this, I can't find qual a high enough quality person to have the confidence in mm -hmm. to do that. Yep. Well, when a lot of us are bringing on people to the team, your first, second, third agent, and all they're getting is the scraps, you still do all the business and they just get what you kind of don't want. Mm -hmm. That's very different from when I told somebody, even if my brother's going to buy a home, it's yours. Huge. That is huge. And I love that, that you said that because that, I believe, is the number one challenge that outside sales agents and showing agents, that relationship has. Uh, it's all or none, right? It's all or none. You can't pick or choose because you never know when that, that one buyer that you know, that well, I just sold their house, so they have to buy. Next thing you know, you show them 10, 12, 15, 30 homes, and then they're renting for the next year or two because they couldn't find anything. It's got to be an all or none mentality. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Well, yeah, I may be a little bit different. So remember I Good. was born That's on the 4th of July. <laughs> so I, uh, I've been around probably more longer than everybody's added up in this room combined. I started 36 years ago. In, in 1990, I was a buyer's agent. So in 1990, uh, a lot of investors started approaching me because of the value they, they saw of me as a buyer's agent. So I, I had a lot of business starting to come, and that's where I started transition. I didn't just jump in all or nothing. I had to make sure that I was paying my bills and keeping the lights on, but at the same time, I had a plan in place. And I, had a, I, I realized that this was an opportunity, and I love the fact that, um, that if, if I have a listing and the buyer falls apart, I still have a listing, I'm still gonna get paid. Yep. So that really attracted me to start chasing the sellers, and then I figured out uh, ways where, where to find the sellers. However, if you're new out there and you're getting into the game, um, at least you better have a plan. You can't just say, hey, look, I'm gonna go, it's all or nothing. Um, I, I, I think you have to eventually do that because I don't, I, I don't show houses to buyers anymore. To become extremely proficient in working with listings, you have to, you, you, to take it to this level, you have to be all or nothing. However, I think yeah. transitioning, I, Jeff, I may, maybe we're saying the same thing. I think you need to have a plan and uh, make sure that you, you have money coming in. Maybe that's kind of what you're saying too. So yeah, so may, you know, make sure that you have a projected plan of where you're gonna find these, these, um, these sellers from, and I'll be glad to talk to you about how I do that. Um, but also, um, keep your business going until you can fully transition. Then you can go. Then you go zero out. Yeah, you have to have. You have to be at a point where you start to develop a small listing inventory, and you have enough pending business to where you can sustain giving up that chunk of change to a showing agent. So that way, it's it's not it's an all or nothing. But there's a little bit of of gap there where you can help bridge the gap to move forward to that all or nothing spot. But you can't let the transition period or the all or nothing phase that you're working on last for you know a year or two right it's it's maybe 90 days 120 days something like that well, and Eric, Jeff, did you, go ahead I, I think that's where starting on the buy side really benefits a lot of agents because you understand the market you understand what buyers are saying in a seller's home you understand the mentality to them when you're sitting there with a the seller and they don't want to replace their beautiful royal blue carpet you can with authority and with conviction let them know what that objection handler needs to be to overcome that objection Whereas yes. if you don't have any experience or validity in the business yet yep. and you're just jumping in with sellers I think you're gonna feel like you're flying a little bit more blind yeah instead of having been a showing agent or been a buyer's agent I think for me that was such a benefit having those three years of experience being in and out of hundreds of homes yep to be able to then say listen this is what the market's telling us I can tell you what the buyer will say in your house the knowledge you yeah the faster. knowledge that you gained by doing that by being on that side first led to the confidence exactly. to be able to sit at a seller's table and know what you're talking about, exactly. right? Love it. Anybody else have anything to add to that? 
Okay, next question I have. So what changed in your business when you shifted your focus towards sellers? So when you made that decision, what did you see take place? What changed in your business? Um, I'll answer that one. So I uh, was really burnt out in my price point. Um, my The suburban price point I'd been doing was about 250 for like 10 years in a row. So I think I sold the same four bedroom, two and a half bath house three times. Literally, they just kept calling me to sell it. So for me, the double down on listings included a focus on price point. So we made it our one thing. And in the first year, we increased our average sales price by $100,000. And it's just been about three years now, we're up to 465. So that was a huge thing for us. Now, I was surprised that transactions dipped. So our transaction count had been so yep. high. Yep. And I'd always heard in markets like yours, oh, you do less transactions with this high price point. And we had the staff and the manpower to do all the same number of transactions, but it happened. I really didn't think it would happen to me, yeah. um, and it did. So that was a shift for us to so, understand. So just to be clear on that, you focused on a higher price point and your transaction count essentially went down because Probably in your market, like most markets around the Midwest, there's not as many high-end sales taking place. So when there's not as many taking place, less available means less closings in, in most, most cases. Sure, but what I, had, I was able to do when we did this is sit down and say, who is the most ideal customer for us? If you're not defining who you want as a customer, then you just are reactive to whatever lead comes in the door or what phone, you know, your, when your phone rings. So we actually said, you know, I wanted to work with professional people who treat me as an advisor so that I could really show up as a consultant for them. And that was the way I wanted to do business and that's how I wanted to be a listing agent. So we just led with that. And so all of our pieces, all of our messaging, all of our graphic design, website, everything really leads with um, me wanting to be hired by the kinds of people that you know, are used to hiring a CPA or an attorney or a physician, yep. um, just like that. Now this will be a fun one, and Eric, if you don't mind chiming in, because you're kind of on the opposite end of the, the spectrum. <laughs> Take it away. So um, my business, when I transferred over into a listing-based business, to me was just, it was revolutionary. It, it changed everything about me and my business across the board. Um, as the listings came in, I'm starting to now give my buyers to my buyer's agent. And so when I relinquished that control, which was extremely hard for me, I realized, oh my God, I can do this with everything else too. And critical point was, I would say, admins, 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 right? Mm -hmm. You're bringing people on to, again, do part of not only the buyer's agent stuff, but now they're doing part of your actual listing job. Mm -hmm. um, and when, I, when that clicked in my head to where I could relinquish control uh, for many other things besides just the buyer's side, that's when I saw my business really take off. Sure. And that was just, uh, you know, that was a, a huge jump for us. Well, not only that, but it also makes it more attractive. Agents want to be a part of, of what you're doing with your team because you're taking a lot of the administration off their plate. Right. Right, so you're seeing it in in your agents that are also they have leverage. Right, same thing with agents on teams using showing agents. That is an opportunity to leverage yourself, so you can go out and either get more buyer business or get more seller business. Last last piece of the equation, I just gotta I gotta learn to have somebody else handle the fires. If there's any anybody that wants to apply for that job. You know. <laughs> oh darn, you don't like that part of the job. Hmm. <laughs> All right, good. So next question I have is, what did your process look like and or what did you have to change to make a listing-based business your focus? What did that process, what did you go through or what did you have to change to where you said, you know what, this is it, this is what we're doing. What did that process look like, that decision and or the action steps to make that shift? I think for our team, the biggest part for us was really identifying where the market of the moment is in our geographic area. And the exam the best example I can give of how not to do it is we, before the 07 downturn, we had 35 listings over a million dollars sitting on the market. And our market went to first time home buyers. Like our, our market went down to 150,000 was the only thing that was moving for 18 months. And yep. I mean, we couldn't give a house away. I, you know, so you're, yes, you're carrying this great inventory, yep. but if you can't give it away or even, I mean, shoot, you're like, I'll pay you to buy this house. Just take it. Yep. Um, you know, that really taught us a big lesson on what you focus on expands. And we had been very luxury focused, which was great. 
until luxury didn't sell. And so we're very intentional about making sure that we're really identifying different pockets of each price point, whether it's relocation or whether it is, um, you know, move up buyers mm -hmm. or whether it's luxury. You know, we're really making sure that we're looking 18 to 24 months out of if the market were to turn, what do we have to do? And so what's nice is so Dallas is already one year into a market shift. Our shift started July of last year. So what was really neat was being in relationship with a lot of these luxury builders because we watched our numbers every week. We could be strategic with them and say, listen, if your specs aren't done, they've got to be on the market now. We got to get out of the luxury business and we're all diving down into first time home buyers. And now we have 120 first time home buyer specs coming up. Yep. But if we weren't paying attention to that and being really strategic about the geographic market of the moment, mm -hmm. we would have been caught upside down big time. Yep. Yep. No, I, I love that. And there's there's probably 50 other examples of ways you can kind of get ahead of the market shift. And that's a perfect example of that. What else? What did you go through? What yeah. was that process like? Yeah, as far as the decision goes, I was, I didn't want the life I was living anymore, right? I, I, I didn't like it. I didn't enjoy it. I, I didn't like the fact that I had to jump in the car at someone's whim and chauffeur them around. And, mm -hmm. you know, I just, I didn't want it anymore. So... The way I actually saw it is I gave up my job. I gave up what I had, mm -hmm. but I was still earning. Basically, I went on a paid training. I was going to earn 60% instead of 100. I was going to earn 60% of what I used to earn. And I was earning more than I needed. Mm -hmm. Okay, So I was earning more than I needed. I was willing to go on a 60% rate as a paid training. And that paid training was I started to study scripts. I started to learn how to prospect expireds. I started to... Um, study direct response marketing. I started to put the pieces together that then became what's today our platform. And those first few years, today I'm very marketing heavy, um, but it was learning those scripts, so many of which you now teach and, mm -hmm. and, and I have to say I've definitely improved on from what was out there before. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but it, it was... Wait, are you calling our old scripts crap? <laughs> no, the industry ones. Oh, okay. No, not your not old yours. Got it. Okay, good. The ones out there. The industry. Um, no, that was a real compliment. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> so, but um, in the way I thought of it was, I'm going to go through this. I'm going to get up on Saturday. I'm going to get up on Sunday. I'm going to learn how to generate income to, so, to replace what I'd given up. And as that income comes in, I also had a financial plan for how much of it would go to my family, so how much of it would go to expenses, to savings, but how much of it would go back in the business to then develop my, you know, a, a real asset that we would own through our marketing programs, which we may or may not talk about in a little bit. But sure. Those were, that was the thought process. So what I heard in that, is just to kind of recap, is you were comfortable giving up a large chunk of the revenue or a large chunk of the commission to spend the time training and getting good at mastering the seller business before you dove in fully. And now once now that you've dove in fully, yes, there's going to be a little bit of a lull during that process, but you make it up on the other end. And I'll say this, and I'm actually processing this right now as we speak and hearing you say that, is one thing I did really right is I didn't spend years and years getting ready to get ready to never do it, to never mm -hmm. make a change, and then w wonder why nothing's changing. Sure. I, I, was, I was willing to just jump in and do that in a calculated way. I knew that I could live on that 60% and mm -hmm. my family would be okay and the mortgage would get paid. Yep, yep, great. Um, I, Jeff, I think what we did is we doubled down on why did, would this house sell and this house wouldn't sell, right? I don't want to be in the listing business. I want to be in the sell house business. Yes. There's a difference between getting a listing that is just a headache, it sucks your money, and it really can impact your reputation with too many for sale signs, especially if it's in your niche community or neighborhood. They mm -hmm. want to say sold as quickly as possible. So a lot of agents have this wishing, hoping, praying strategy and the MLS, and that is how they sell houses. Yep. So what we really did is study the science. I have a healthcare background and my husband's a physician and evidence-based medicine, you can't do anything in medicine without the evidence and the, the clinical pathways letting you do it. And insurance yep. won't pay for it. So, But real estate agents weren't doing evidence-based practices. They were just using a dartboard. So we know that women are the home buying decision makers of the family. We know that um, people really want to buy something that they want to buy. And if you don't have a sellable product, then 
price is your only negotiating ability and we want to protect your equity. So yep. we really figured out why houses sell and doubled down on that and now we're selling everyone. Awesome, love it. Let's shift gears a little bit, guys. Uh, let's talk about your top three sources for listing taken. Uh, now it can be so far this year, it could be last year, it can be last 12 months. What comes to mind when you think about your top three sources? And my follow-up question to that will be, for those of you that answer, is, okay, what is why, what makes that, when, when you look at your top three sources of business, let's pick one and let's talk about why that's your preferred source. So let's first start with the top three sources. Uh, my top sources are referrals, and I, by referrals I mean referral sources, okay? yep. repeat business, and investors. Okay, yep. referrals, uh, referral sources, which we'll maybe dig into that one, uh, repeat business, mm -hmm. and investors. Correct. Got it, okay. Um, finders, for lack of a better term, or bird dogs, um, auctions, online auctions, and then offline auctions, the sheriff sales, the judicial sales. Yep. That's where we get a lot of inventory from. Yep, yep, which um, one of the reasons you're on this panel is because that's not always a common one, so we're gonna hear about that in a second. Yeah, I'd Thank like you. to talk about the finders too. I've got some good good ideas for the, pe for yeah. the Love people. Love it, so we're gonna dig into that in a second, so keep that in mind. Seychelle, top three. Our top three are past client sphere of influence, agent yep. to agent referrals, and Yelp. Really? Wow, okay. Uh, past client, uh, sphere of influence referrals, agent referrals, and Yelp. Got it. Dan, top three sources. Our top three are farming, radio, and what we call listing marketing, which we categorize as anything that comes off a listing, such as open houses being the heaviest of that, Yep. and sign calls. Got it. Perfect. Christy, top three sources. Yep, our number one is repeat referral sphere, SOI. Number two is indiehomes.com. We doubled down on our website. And number three is direct mail. Got it, okay, right. direct mail, interesting, I love that. Okay, so what I'd like to do is kind of go down the line. If you would pick one of those three that you shared, whichever one's your favorite or whichever one is, is your most productive, uh, pick one of those three and kind of share with us why that's a big source of business for you and what's unique about it into, into the, the, in other words, if I'm in the audience and I wanted to go after that source of business, what I would need to do or implement. Okay, so my choice would be investors. And how many of you guys out here absolutely cannot stand working with investors? Raise your hand. Come on, get no, your hands up. We know it's like 90%. <laughs> All right, norm yeah, normally, you know. You I love getting that call. Yeah, we're shot, you know, we wanna buy a th right. uh, 10, $30,000 homes. We want you to do all the work right. and we want you to give us 1% of your commission back. Right, so, yep. and this was something that we really had to work on as a team. Okay, mm -hmm. because a lot of our agents came over with a retail mentality. Okay, um, and the investor based business, I never understood uh, why the majority of real estate agents absolutely hated it. Now, I, that's how I came up in real estate. When I was 19 years old, I started buying rental properties. And uh, you know, the only reason I got my real estate license is because I wanted to find the good deals. So I've been around investors. I was an investor. I'm used to them. Yep. Um, and you're gonna see something. I mean, we're, we're moving to a more traditional real estate market right mm -hmm. now. It's not, you know, it's not seller's market, to, you know, off the charts. And I know, you know, we're from Every different places different. in the yep. country, yep. of course. Um, but it, where we're at, it's again, transition into a more traditional market. Balance. So out of the referrals that you're talking about or the sources that we're talking about, who are the most stable? And the most stable to me are those investors, those bread and butter investors that are always there, that are always looking. And so that's why, you know, again, we're gonna really focus on that uh, yep. a lot this year. Um, but as, um, as I had to sell this to our team, um, the concept is not just that I'm gonna sell to investors or I'm gonna sell to retail. Ask yourself this question, okay? Are you working with somebody who is going to be an account? All right, and I, and mm. I learned this, I used to sell computers and I was an account man and that's what I did. You sold the guy one time and after those transactions adds up, that guy trusts you yep. and he comes back and he comes back and he comes back. And you have to ask yourself, okay, why would you not wanna work with somebody that you can build a rapport with one time, that you can earn their business one time, and it just keeps coming? You're an account manager. 
Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So instead of looking at your client as a transaction, yeah. a listing or a sale, mm -hmm. that's an account that you're going to have for life. And, and, and yeah, I'm talking about investors here, but that's not it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're also talking about those cheerleaders mm -hmm. as well. You're yeah. also talking about those lifelong relationships, the people that you can see past the one transaction. Yep. I love that. So now that was great, by the way, Eric, I have a follow up question on that. Sure. What do you say to an agent that says, yeah, but investors, it's like twice the work for half the commission because the price points are so low. What do you say to that? So, and again, you know this, we do minimum commissions. So, yep. you know, I, I'll make that argument, but mm -hmm. I'll show them how it's easy. And normally the argument is not, uh, I'm not going to make enough money. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cause we work the clients we have. Yep. If they had somebody else, we wouldn't be having the conversation. Right. Right? Yep. Yep. But I will take them by the hand, I'll introduce them to an investor, I will teach them the language, and I will show them that paycheck. And sometimes, and again, with investors, sometimes you don't even show the house. Mm -hmm. You know? Yep. What's I your mean, average time on the deal? Um, our off market stuff? Yeah, probably not 38 and a half hours. Oh my God. Exactly. That's right? what I'm saying. So yep. the We'll, we'll talk more about it. But, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we have flip a house in five minutes. Yep. If it's priced right. Got it. Love it. All right. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Frank, uh, number one source or top I'm source? Do a little twist. Great. Here, okay. So I'm going to talk about bird dogs. So there's a lot of this is the, and Eric knows what I'm talking about because we do the same kind of dance. Um, I, but I, I concentrate heavily on uh, flips. So I'm always looking for off-market places to find properties. And the one thing is a lot of these bird dogs don't know what they're doing. So they've got the property priced closer to retail than they do that, uh, that it would work. So what I do is I convert those into listings. And I tell them, look, you want to get paid, bro, then you know we'll, we'll put it all together. We'll package it all together and make sure you get paid. But I got to get the listing. So uh, but move back, backing up, first of all, if I were here today, and I were speaking to this audience, oh, I am, and um, I, I would give you some advice. I would say, start. you wanna start building your investment business? Start looking for bird dogs. You can go online, you can go on Facebook, you can go on investment groups. Uh, probably the biggest thing I could drop on you today is go to meetups. So whatever your town is, uh, for I, I did your town, mm -hmm. and I did, I did Brighton, I can pull it up off my phone, Brighton, uh, uh, Michigan, uh, uh, real estate meetups. Yep. That's all I did. I came up with five groups that are that meet on a regular basis, and they have a, an audience of anywhere from 374 to thousands of people. Mm -hmm. uh, there's now the reason why that works well for a newbie, uh, a new agent, is there's going to be a lot of new investors there. A seasoned investor that goes to the bigger places like the auctions, the online, offline auctions. They will sniff you out in a New York minute. They, they really want to deal with seasoned people, yep. and they don't want to have to uh, take on a guinea pig. Yep. The, newer, the newer investor, and there's plenty of them out there that have you know, half a million line of credit, a million dollar line of credit. So there's, there's investors are unlimited. I mean, I, I have thousands of investors. I can't even, I can't even talk and get to them because yep. you know, I, I go to a lot of different investor group meetings. But if, if you're interested in, in the in, in chasing investors go online and research the uh the meetups, meetups the real estate meetups and then start attending them and you you have to figure out your brand your value because you, your value if you're brand new and you don't have any experience then you have to talk about your office experience you have to you know you have to talk about the fact <coughs> That, excuse me that you're willing to work day and night yeah because they want you know a lot of the a lot of people are busy that's why I have, to, I have a huge team because I am busy so they may not be able to reach me but they can reach somebody else but going back to the meetups you can meet the investors aren't the only people that go there there's lenders hard money lenders there's bird dogs so you have to go in there and put get put your hunting outfit on and go get them you know when I get up and speak at an investor group and I speak a minimum once a month, I always go raise your hand if you're a bird dog. And I got my team there and they're looking around. They're gonna, they're gonna go get them. I said, raise your hand if you're an investor and you need some off market properties. So, I mean, you, you gotta have a plan. And I have a plan when I go in, but it, for a new, 
a newer agent or an, or an agent that's new to the investment game and you want to get in the investment game, I, I would recommend starting at the meetups and then start building your brand and start, if you want to transition into that world, start building a brand and the more experience you get and the better job you do, the, 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 you can start growing into working with, with uh, more accomplished so can I, can I ask a question that some of the audience may be wondering? Explain bird dog in the real estate industry to us. Okay. A lot of us may, sure. may know the bird so, dog in like a car business or something, but explain right. how that works in the real estate industry. Right. So a bird dog is a person that gets offline properties, and they have multiple ways of getting it. I, I've got guys that, that spend thousands of dollars a month on, on uh, direct marketing. Uh, there's other guys that, that do a lot of door knocking in the area. They drive by door knock. There's a lot of hustlers out there, but it's it's someone that that has a game plan, and they're I'm looking for people that they can bring me properties on a regular basis offline because, as we know, it's the MLS is very difficult to buy off of from a wholesale perspective, mm -hmm. and you got too many people that don't know what they're doing, and too many agents that don't know what they're doing, and they're they're getting the wrong information. And they're buying, they're they're paying up. So I mean, another thing I do is I go I go look at old closed properties, Jeff, and I and I call those people up, and we we, we get a hold of them and we make offers on their houses. We're like you, this has been sitting for two years. Do you want to get rid of it? Yep. You know because they realize they bought it for too much money, and if they rehab it, they're going to lose even more money. Yep. So how does the how does the bird dog get compensated? So the bird, so what the bird ha dog has to do legally is they have what they do. The, the smart ones will tie the properties up mm -hmm. and assign it. Got it. It's it's real simple. Don't complicate this thing, guys. Don't you know? Walk. You're here today. Figure out, you know, one, two, three, four, five things that can change your business. Keep it simple. Don't make this complicated. Right. All right. Thank you for that, Frank. Say I, I would just add something else yes. real quick. I think at least for our region, so the bird dog traditionally is more often called wholesalers uh, in our neck of the woods or assigners. So wholesalers or, or assigners is another word for bird dog. Gotcha. And their number one job is to go out and find properties to essentially sell to investors. We touched on this. At the, yep. Yeah. That's right. Great, so Shell. I love that. So our business is completely opposite. Yep. Uh, we which is were, why we have this great combination. Yeah, which is why combination. this is so great. I'm yep. taking notes from you guys. Um, our our business really believes in working deeply with and through long term relationships with people. And so, like, I I'm not looking to have a database of fifty thousand people. I want you know a database of you know several hundred people that I've met over the last several years, and I'm getting to know you really well. And what what we put into place um, two years ago that's really exploded our listing business is um, we asked the question, if somebody's already shown at some point in business that they're willing to know, like, trust, or refer me, what could I do that gets that top of mind awareness to where instead of once a year or once every five years they think of us, that they might be willing to refer us once a year, twice a year, three times a year. And so we did something really simple where we created a raving fans month uh, quarterly package that we send out to anyone who's referred us in the past year. Yep. And we used it as an excuse to leverage relationships with local business owners yes. to buy from them in their off season. So now we're doubling down on getting great relationships with local business owners that are entrepreneurs and let's say like for example florists I don't know if you knew this but July is their slowest time so we would buy like an arrangement from them mm -hmm. and we would box it up with all of our branding and packaging on it and that's when we would buy from them the same thing like you don't want to buy a Christmas item from a Christmas store in the middle of December yep right buy it when it's their off season and then yep. save it and ship it and so that took us from, we started that in 2017. We had 163 referrals from people that had shown that they know, like, and trust us. Last year, we had 225 from just changing that one simple thing. And um, it's cost effective. You can control the cost. Your branding is all over it. Mm -hmm. And the idea that we got out of it, does anyone ever like subscribe to those um, like subscription boxes, whether it's Stitch Fix or FabFitFun or, I mean, you guys yep. all know what I'm talking about? The clothing box stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my listing manager would get those in and it was like show and tell every month when she would get these boxes because it's a surprise. There's something un unique in there, something yep. thoughtful and different. 
and that was where, where we really kind of thought was, how do we delight and surprise our customers in a way that keeps yes. us top of mind yep. and reminds them if they already know, like, and trust us, how can we get repeat behavior? Yep. Um, so, so far this year, so it was 163, 225, we're already at 224 this year. Great, I love it. And what's great about that is, you know, it's very in line with what we talked about this morning, which is the best way to get business from your database instead of asking for business and expecting them to refer you is to provide value. And the absence of value price is always the issue, right? Yes. And, and that's something I think you do such a great job. A great job when you work with your scripting and you, like what you guys teach yep. is that you are a real estate consultant and you guys provide so much value to the customer yep. that there's no reason why they wouldn't want to trust you and refer you. Yeah. So one of the things that I want to point out is tomorrow we're digging deep into that with you. Uh, we're doing a one-on-one -on -one interview with Seychelles on how do you guys specifically add value to your database because you guys have mastered it. So uh, That's, we're, we're very gonna, passionate We're going to dig yeah. more into that tomorrow. So uh, let's keep going down the line. Number one source of business, uh, why, how did you arrive at it? Let's keep it going. So farming. Farming is uh, what I'm most passionate about in our marketing attempts. And there's a, there's a reason for it, which is that all the other business we do, even our past clients move there, they move there, they move there, and that listing didn't help me get that listing. And when we're calling, you know, just whether it's expireds or any of it, it's all over the place, unless you're concentrating those efforts in one unique area, mm -hmm. um, which I guess would be a form of farming. Um, and by the way, all that's important, and we do all those things that I just mentioned, but what we use those funds for that we keep as reinvested, recommitted profits is we invest it into our farm to grow it and to go deeper with it because here's the magic of a farm. See, when, and we're very mail uh, heavy. Okay, so we're doing a lot of direct mail. How often? We, uh, two times a month. Mm -hmm. To right. how many, how big is the farm? It is, it is 16,000 houses right now. We actually just reduced it down from 32,000 houses. Okay, um, now let me ask you this question. Why? Are you doubling up on your efforts? Is that? Because we're going a lot deeper with yeah. our original zip code. We're doing Love more that. events for them. We're giving more value and we just wanna, too we just want to realize many, we expanded when we didn't need to. We could have Too many down. agents spread themselves way too thin by thinking they need to have this big farm and this big database that they, you can't get to them all. You're better off. I'd rather you send four mailers a month I know four is extreme, but four as an example, four mailers a month to a farm of 100 versus one mailer a month to a farm of 400. You're going to get more on that four to 100. You were touching on this earlier today, and to me, the size of your farm, if you choose to do it, it's the size that you can sustain and mail to at least twice a month, the first eight weeks every week, forever. That's the size of your farm. So if that means it's 100 homes, great. If that means it's 1,000 houses, good. It, there's no number it needs to be. But in any case, the reason I, I love it so much is that unlike all of our other business that spreads out, moves away, et cetera, see, when we're mailing, we're hitting them with messages, with marketing messages. And it's very direct language. It stands out. And I'll talk about that in a moment. So as that's happening, there's kitchen table conversations that are happening behind closed doors that nobody knows about. They haven't yet raised their hand and said, hey, you know, marketplace, we're going to sell our house. And so they're seeing this hit their home as they're having this private conversation. They then notice that there's a new listing across the street th three doors over and it happens to be yours. It happens to be the person that keeps mailing them. And so they say, oh, there, Dan just got... They just listed that house. And they keep getting the mail, they keep having the private conversation. Then you're having your big, say, grand opening, open house. We do 60 signs, when we literally do 60 signs, we pay someone $80 off Craigslist. We have like four or five of these guys. And we put the signs out as of, not, as of um, so you use the So you use the obnoxious marketing approach. We go heavy. And so, and you know, what's the value of that? I mean, I, you know, it's, it's huge value. So yep. anyway, they see the signs, they come to the open house, they meet you in person, you're now literally physically connected as you probably shook their hand. <laughs> they continue to think about it, they go back home, they get a mailer, then your sold sign comes out. Dan yep. just sold that house. And by the way, if you're not putting a pending or sold sign or whatever your market will allow the second it goes under contract, a lot of you are selling homes in like seven, eight, nine, ten days. You're, the neighbors though, unfortunately, think it's taking you 45 or 60. Mm -hmm. Yep. So this, the solar pending sign comes out and they say, well, there you just did that. 
And so long story short, you end up getting their listing. And so now there's a for sale sign on their house. And guess what? Over there, there's another couple that was going through the same experience just early in the cycle. So now this listing is going to help you get that one. And that's why farming is so powerful. It, it's, a, it's a strategy that makes you shift proof. There's a lot of part timers right now, a lot of cousins and aunts and sister-in-laws that are getting listings right now. Yep. And they'll continue to, by the way. But they're going to fail when the market gets tougher. And as soon as they do fail, they're going to turn and say, all right, well, then where's Dan? Where's the expert? Yep. And so you have the opportunity to build that. And for us, it's been direct mail with all the other supporting pieces. I appreciate what you said about, about the sign thing, because I've actually heard agents say, well, I sold it in 48 hours. I don't, I don't need to pay the money to put a sign up. It's like, are, are you kidding me? Do you realize that by putting your rider up there and putting the number, what that's going to do for the neighborhood and the community? And the other thing I hear a lot is, well, but if I put the sold sign up, I might not get a sign call from a buyer. Mm -hmm. You're at the listing conference, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah, you might <laughs> not, but you might get the neighbor's listing. Correct, yep, love it. I'm just gonna leave with one thing, because I, I know uh, limited time. So if you are putting marketing messages out like that, which, right, I'm talking about spending money, if your marketing message, if your language is not, if you're not using strong copy, if, you're, if you read your own marketing and just go, hey, that's nice and comfortable, sounds good, neighborhood expert, I'm the one that cares, best customer service, that's my favorite. That's the mail that the consumer doesn't notice, doesn't see, and tosses away in a heartbeat. The only way your marketing is gonna be noticed is if it actually makes you uncomfortable. If you read your, if you read what you're about to put on, go, holy crap! Am I really, am I gonna do this? Am I sending this out? Like this is scaring me. Now you have a shot at getting them when they're doing this. You get a shot at, whoa, what's that? And now they're paying attention. That's the only chance you have. If you're just a neighborhood friendly agent, you're right in the trash. Yep. Awesome. All right, Christy. Next up, let's hear it. Yeah, mine's my website, aphomes.com. For fun, we're what, 400 miles away from my home. If you got out your cell phone and just Googled something that might relate to real estate in Indianapolis, I'd be I'd like to test this theory so far away. Yep. Um, but we're getting between 4,000 and 8,000 visitors to our website a day. Yep. That's generating between seven and 18 leads a day just from the organic results of our website. Mm -hmm. It's really incredible. But the way that we're doing that is double downing on content. Your website is the long game. It takes a while and it's all about content. But we write about things that people actually search. No one searches Indianapolis realtor. I mean, people mm -hmm. don't do that. Mm -hmm. They Google things like, what are the caramel neighborhoods that have a community pool, mm -hmm. right? What are yep. the USA Gymnastics competitive teams in Carmel? Yep. And people make buying decisions based on what are the neighborhoods that have a boat dock on Geist? That's how people, that's how you ask, you guys you ask Google questions. The average Google search is over 10 words and they're called long tail searches. You just talk to it like it's your friend. And so we write articles based on that. I find my ideas from what people ask me about out, or there's these Facebook groups called like Indianapolis Moms. It's like 25,000 people, and they just ask their favorite mom friend every question in the world from mm -hmm. where do I get my dog groomed to what I mean, you would be so surprised the questions that people yep. ask. And so we double down on content about that. And then we always, whenever we do direct mail like you, Dan, is we drive people to our website with every piece that we do. So this says Carmel home values are at all time high. Are you curious about the price of your home? Find out in 60 seconds at yep. IndieCuriosity.com. So we drive people to our site with everything that we do. And then we have a great, great lead capture. Let's hear it for our panelists. Thank you guys, nice job. Thank you for taking your time to join Jeff today on the Live Unreal with Glover U podcast. To get started on having an unreal business, take the real estate self-assessment. After you complete the assessment, a member of Glover U will get on a call with you to create an action plan to improve your score. Go to www.gloveru.com self. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe. Search for Live Unreal with Glover U on iTunes, Podbean, or Spotify and subscribe today. Until next time, remember, the best way to get business from your database instead of asking for business and expecting them to refer is to provide value.